looks like we are just getting used to all kinds of uh, <laughs> new things here. Uh, thank you, Josephine, for reading. I know you were thrown off a little bit because you had the wrong uh, scripture for you for reading. But anyway, good morning to all of you. What a pleasure it is to see you all uh, joining us for uh, worship today. Today, as of course, we have uh, seen in the songs, the songs that we sang and uh, uh, all the readings that we have done, today marks the beginning of the Holy Week. Of course, it's, we know that it's called Palm Sunday. Uh, some people would like to call it Passion Sunday because there is, of, there is so much passion being uh, manifested as Jesus, as it is called his triumphal entry into the, uh, into the city of Jerusalem. Well, today we are, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, we are invited to praise and worship Jesus as the one who is faithful to his word. Jesus Christ was willing to go the distance and fulfill all of those prophecies as was written in the, in the scriptures. Even at the incredible cost of his own life, the incredible cost to himself. So our focus today, as we look at this story about Jesus' triumphal entry, uh, and to conclude his ministry as we know it, uh, we want to pick up some of those important points in this narrative, in this story. So interestingly enough, this is the triumphal entry, but it is also a departure. Uh, that sounds like an oxymoron, right? A, a contradiction, entry and departure. Well, Jesus is entering Jerusalem for the sake of a departure. And follow with me as we discuss and study, how is this entry and departure you know, put together in this most remarkable story that we read in the scriptures. Of course, Luke chapter 19, which was read to us, in verse 28, uh, it begins by saying, and after he said this, he went on ahead, going to Jerusalem. So in Verse 28, it says, after he said this, and the question for us is, what is it that he said? It's good for us to understand, uh, to understand the story, to pick up the story. What did Jesus say? And if you go back in the scripture, it was the parable of the talents. You most, all of you will remember the parable of the talents where uh, Jesus tells the people about how a king decided to go to a far country, to a distant country. And before he went, he gave these talents to his, uh, you know, stewards, to his servants. That is what he said. And we all remember that story of how he expected them to occupy. Why did he say that? Why did he give the parable of the talents? And this is how Luke records it, the gospel of Luke. And then he says, then he goes on to Jerusalem. You see, a lot of people or almost all of them thought that Jesus was going to Jerusalem because he was going to establish the kingdom right away. He was going to Jerusalem to fight with the Romans, defeat the Roman Empire, and bring his own kingdom. But Jesus was helping them understand, no, uh, this was not going to be 
done this way. But people are very happy. Oh, he's going to Jerusalem. Maybe this is the time, you know. Uh, most of us will remember uh, the great Subhas Chandra Bose, you know, who fought for the freedom of our country. And you remember how he uh, galvanized the Indian Army, or I don't know what he called it. I think he called it the Indian National Army. And he said, Chalo Dili, because he wanted to uh, inspire everyone to go to Delhi and take over, you know, the country from the British. And maybe this is how the people thought as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, they all probably thought, Chalo Jerusalem, <laughs> let us now take over the Roman Empire and now we will establish the kingdom. But you see, they misunderstood. That's why Jesus gave the parable of the talents. And he was helping them understand, I'm going to a distant country. In other words, it's going to take time. And as we know today, 2,000 years later, it has taken all this time for us. And we are still waiting for the return of Jesus. But of course, there's an important lesson for the disciples to know. The question is, he, he was hoping they will understand that the kingdom was not going to be established in its fullness at that time, but it's going to take more and more time. The question for them is, will I remain faithful until Jesus returns? Will I remain faithful using whatever talents I have? Whatever, you know, opportunities and resources and giftings that I may have had, I may have been given, will I remain faithful with them till whenever Jesus decides to return? And that's a question for us today. We are also longing for the kingdom to be established in its fullness. And the question we have to ask is, will it come in my lifetime? Will it not come in my lifetime? I don't know. We don't know. But the question is, will I understand and know that I have been called to remain faithful and use the talents that I have, the resources that I have, and for the advancement of the kingdom, for the preparation of the kingdom? You know, God expects that. As somebody was saying, it always, almost seems like, you know, the church has gone lazy. I don't know if people are really using talents. They don't even care to know what talents they have. They have no time for kingdom work. They're too busy. They're building their own empires, like Mr. Kulasingham used to say, our founder pastor. You know, they're all building their own kingdoms rather than recognizing the need for us to build the kingdom of God. So that's the question that we have to ask, even as we celebrate Palm Sunday. How am I being making a difference for the kingdom today in my life? Maybe in a very small way, but nevertheless, a significant, significant way in the, you know, in the establishment of the kingdom. And so after this incident, the uh, scripture carries on, Luke chapter 19. Uh, Jesus then addresses his, uh, the, the people with him and he says, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied, colt meaning a, a small young donkey, on which no one has sat, uh, no one has ever sat. Interesting, isn't it? These uh, details that are being given, right? Lose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you losing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So we have this very, very peculiar, what do you call it, uh, situation where Jesus decides to sit on a donkey <laughs> to go to Jerusalem. Many times he just walks wherever he goes. But this time, for some reason, he decides to bring this donkey, a young colt, 
the colt of a donkey, which is a young one. Nobody sat on it before. And he decides to ride into Jerusalem. Now, is he, does a king ride into, you know, into wherever he wants to go? Does he go on a donkey? How does a king normally travel? And especially in the Roman Empire. I mean, it has to be a horse or a chariot, right? With a great procession, right? I mean, it's a, that's the triumphal entry of a great king, I mean, especially in the Roman Empire. But it was prophesied that Jesus would do this. And the prophecy is uh, given in the book of Zechariah in the, in the Minor Prophets, chapter 9. Let me just read that to you. Notice it says, Zechariah 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. There it is. Prophesied that Jesus would do that as Praveen was, you know, meditating on those words of the cross. Jesus picked up these from the old covenant or, or the old testament scriptures. And here it is, a prophecy about Jesus sitting on a donkey. What is the symbolism? What is Jesus trying to convey by this symbolic, uh, you know, gesture as he rides into Jerusalem? Well, there are several. Let me just list a few. He was entering the city on a donkey, not a horse, not a chariot. That symbolized that he is arriving in peace. In other words, he is not a conquering king arriving uh, to wage war, to fight the Roman Empire. That was not what he was doing. He was trying to help people understand, I come in peace. The donkey being a lowly animal, he is helping people understand the kingdom of God is not established by swords and spears. It is not established by guns and tanks and fighter aircrafts. Jesus Christ does not establish his kingdom in the way this world does. He establishes kingdom completely in a way, in a manner which we can't even imagine. By sacrificing himself, by giving his life, he wins the victory. So he is basically helping people understand, I come in peace. And through peace, I will bring the establishment of the kingdom. Right? Also, when people saw him sitting on a donkey, they should have immediately recognized the prophecy. Right? Right? And what does the prophecy basically prove? This is the Messiah. Well, that's, that's what people were struggling to understand, right? Where is the Messiah? I mean, the prophesied Messiah should come and establish the kingdom. Well, here is the Messiah that was prophesied. So he was basically helping people understand, yes, indeed, your Messiah has come. He's riding on a donkey. You should know he is the Messiah. And the scripture also says the your king comes to you riding on a donkey. In other words, he is already a king. Right? Jesus was already a king and his king, kingship was from above. You see, human beings don't make him a king. We don't crown him a king. No government crowns him a king. The uh, you know, uh, uh, the League of Nations or the United Nations don't crown him a king. His kingship is heavenly. His authority is from heaven. There comes another question. Will you and I accept this king? See, he is already king. And of course, he's going into the far country to, to formalize it. And when he comes, he is a king. The question is, will, can we accept such a king? 
a king that rides on a donkey, a king that talks about peace, the king that talks about sacrifice. Is he's not a king that talks about guns and ammunition. He is talking about sacrifice and humility and peace. Can we accept such a king? Can we follow such a king? Many times I wonder, I wish we had enough strength and power to just establish things. But no, if we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to accept Jesus as our king, wow, it's going to be different. It's very, very, very difficult to do it in the way Jesus wants us to do it, by sacrifice and sometimes through suffering and through pain, we bring the kingdom. And what does is, what is it also foreshadow? Jesus sitting on a donkey and riding into Jerusalem. Immediately they must have, I mean, the people who know the Old Testament should have known what is going on here? What is happening? They probably should have remembered Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3, where it says, Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. What was Abraham doing? Why a donkey? Where was he going? You remember the story? He was going to sacrifice his son. Isaac was to be sacrificed. And when they saw Jesus sitting on a donkey, what should they have, they have thought? He is going to sacrifice. He is going to die for the world because he didn't want us to die. He was going to taste death, enter into death, so that we would have freedom from death. And finally, Jesus sits on a donkey. You know what was a donkey known for? It's called a burden bearer, right? We basically put, uh, you know, things to carry, you know, items to carry on a donkey. I still remember, I don't know if it's still being done now, maybe it is gone. We used to have a dobi, you know, those long days. He used to come home and take our clothes, wash it and iron it and bring it back. And, uh, and he used to collect all these clothes and then they all put it on a donkey and all the donkeys go to Tangbert where there is a dobi guard. <laughs> is it still there? I'm not sure. It's still probably still there, right? And uh, so the donkey was a burden bearer. What was Jesus trying to show? Jesus was the burden bearer of this world. He was the burden bearer of all human beings. Jesus is going to bear our burden. And he is going to give us rest. So that we might have life eternal. And so it's a very rich, very rich uh, you know, picture that is painted when Jesus sits on a donkey. And especially a young donkey. Nobody has sat. And that shows that sense of humility that Jesus was trying to show. That he's coming in peace. He's not only going on a mature donkey, but a young donkey that has never been used. Even more humbling himself going on you know, a beast like this. And then one more thought as uh, we move on. Picking up from Luke chapter 19 that was read to us in the beginning in verse 36, it says, as he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. And he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives. The whole multitudes of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. So the people were absolutely ecstatic. They were just so happy to see. Of course, they had the mistaken uh, you know, uh, uh, conclusion that Jesus was coming to establish the kingdom. But they said, well, this is our king. And I think, as Linda had explained to us, they put their cloaks. That was the red carpet of those days. 
you know, they were willing to give their own clothing because they wanted to invite the king. But what is this all about? Why was the people exalting uh, him, you know, Jesus and singing Hosanna that we sang so many times now today? Hosanna. You see, the presence of the Lord brings out a response. Uh, it brings out a response of worship. And this is nothing else but worship. You see, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest heaven. This is nothing short of literally declaring Jesus to be God Almighty. You see, he comes in the name of the Lord. He is the Lord. The very name of the Lord is his badge, his identity. He is the Lord, the King of glory, even as we sang it. So what happens when you come in the presence of the King of glory? Worship. It is automatic worship. Knowing Jesus is, I mean, and, and knowing his character, isn't it joyous? The worship should be spontaneous, right? But of course, some people got jealous of him. If you remember the Pharisees, they said, Jesus, don't tell, tell, tell these people, don't praise you like this. And then you remember what Jesus said? Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The stones would shout out. There, once again, another metaphor. Another symbolism. What is this stone is shouting out? And there are various ways for us to look at it. And I'll just give you two. One is the fact that it was such a momentous occasion that even inanimate nature would vibrate with singing. He is the creator of the earth and the heavens and the whole cosmos. The whole cosmos would rise up in singing because their creator has now come to establish his kingdom. Basically, once again, showing that he is the Lord, God Almighty. Now, there could be another meaning to it when Jesus says that the stones would shout out. Perhaps it's also he is also referring to judgment. If you remember, there are some passages in the Old Testament as well as what happens, you know, in the New Testament. The stones being tumbled, the stones falling down, the stones, that is a sign of judgment. And so maybe Jesus is also telling the Pharisees, if you can't see who I am, you will be judged. There will be judgment that will come upon you know, all of those who will refuse to accept Christ our Lord. So these are various ways we can look at this triumphal entry. There are many, many uh, others, you know, lessons we can learn. But let's uh, conclude here. Jesus had entered Jerusalem, but... It was an entry of departure. You remember I was talking about the departure and the entry, the, the contradiction. How can you enter? And it also being a departure. And that is something that, you know, we can take tremendous heart with, you know, heart at. You see, Jesus' own entry into Jerusalem was actually going to be a departure for him because he was concluding his earthly ministry. The departure will involve facing the wrath of man. He would be beaten and spit upon. He would be, you know, tortured and then crucified. Uh, what for? For our sins. He would literally submit himself to the wrath of man. Does that sound strange? 
We always talk about the wrath of God. We sing it in that, which I think is an unfortunate uh, choice of words. God's wrath is not uh, the what we think of. But he faced the wrath of man. Human beings tortured him, brutalized him, crucified him. Right? And what was Jesus doing? As he absorbed every one of those torture, every one of that suffering and pain, he was announcing the departure of suffering and pain and death. There comes the entry for the departure. The departure would be that sin would depart. Suffering would depart. Pain would depart. Misery and death would depart. Jesus Christ's entry was the departure of sin and pain and misery and suffering. And the departure of the body from the tomb, which we will celebrate, you know, coming Sunday, foreshadows the departure of our own earthly bodies into the glorious body that someday we will have. And so Jesus entering into Jerusalem, now nothing can stop him. Even death will not stop him. He will now go to Jerusalem. And it is actually a departure for the king of glory, but also a departure of all the misery and the suffering. And so, brethren, today, Palm Sunday, it's the wonderful news of an entry of departure. Right? Jesus had entered Jerusalem to make sure that sin and misery finally departs from this cosmos, which we know is prophesied to take place. And we can finally enter into a world of peace and beauty, harmony and joy in the embrace of the triune God, the kingdom of God in its fullness. We long for that time. There is no hope otherwise. If that kingdom is not real, then there is no hope for mankind. We will remain in our misery. And look, the way things are going today, we are only, you know, refining pain and misery. We are only making it even more, you know, uh, what do you say, Techno technologically savvy. Our pain is becoming more and more refined technologically. But we can never get rid of it. The only hope is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So uh, let's look forward to Good Friday when Jesus, when we will once again reflect upon Jesus' words, it is finished. Yes, the entry for the departure of sin and suffering. Before we conclude, I'd like you to hear President Greg Williams, who also captures the mood of Palm Sunday. And he talks about it being like a going away party. He has an interesting twist to it, right? But he's basically talking about how indeed the going away is to celebrate the exit of sin and death. Then the anticipation of the returning King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll play that video for you at this time, and then I will then lead you into the communion. I have a friend who worked for a manager known for making the whole department miserable. The manager was such an oppressive boss that when she announced she would be leaving the company, the staff struggled to hide their joy as she served her two week notice. But they were able to secretly plan a going away party for the manager's last day on the job. Only they did not invite the manager. Once she went away, they threw a party. Well, that's not usually what we're trying to do when we throw a going away party. Typically, we mean to celebrate the person who's going away, not the relief of their going. But consider this, 
When we celebrate Palm Sunday and Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, we are in a way doing a little of both. If you remember the story, Jesus is entering Jerusalem when the city erupts into celebration as they think Jesus is coming to overthrow the Romans. So they are celebrating the person of Jesus, but Jesus did not come to Jerusalem to conquer the Romans. He came to die on a Roman cross. Little did the inhabitants know they were throwing Jesus a going away party. And it's a going away party worth throwing. When Jesus died on the cross, he gave the oppressive rule of evil, sin, and death its two-week notice. This present evil age is on its way out. Hallelujah. Like those who celebrated the departure of an oppressive boss, we can celebrate the departure of the oppressive rule of evil and sin that has long tormented our souls. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he entered to triumph over the devil's rule of darkness and fear, bringing us into his light and love. Listen to these words of celebration often read on Palm Sunday. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. As we celebrate Palm Sunday, may our praise and joyous worship be a response of overflowing gratitude for who Jesus is and what he has done. Not overthrowing cities and rulers, but conquering sin and death and reigning in our lives. Hosanna, Hosanna. I'm Greg Williams, speaking of life.